Broadening our military mission to include regime change would be a mistake. Welcome back to Morning Joe. It is 22 past the hour. Joining us now, the former Republican governor of Minnesota, Tim Pawlenty, back at the table this morning. Good to have you, sir. Morning, okay, so convince me. What would be the difference if it was you making that speech last night? Well, one of the things I said on March 7th, which is now several weeks ago, is that we should have established the no-fly zone. I supported it. I believe the humanitarian mission and the avoidance of slaughter in Libya was important. But keep in mind, back then, the rebels had substantial momentum. In my view, they had Gaddafi on the ropes. He was talking openly, according to news reports, about leaving voluntarily. And I think the threat of or the implementation of the no-fly zone back then would have given the rebels a quick and easy or relatively easier window of opportunity to get rid of Gaddafi. And now we're in this position of having a president of the United States saying Gaddafi must go, but we're not going to necessarily make him go. So what and that's untenable. I would have established the no-fly zone. I would have established it earlier. Mm -hmm. And now when you have the president of the United States and the leader of the free world saying Gaddafi must go, then Gaddafi's got to go. Okay. And what about, How about the, the budget reality, though? How about he's got to go? Let him just go on my premise that he goes. There's a vacuum. We can't just pick up and leave. We sit. We cry about this budget deficit. We talk about the Pentagon. We talk about entitlements. Yet we're going to start spending more money now in Libya. Because that is part of your message. Too. Yeah. The, the situation in a post Qaddafi era in Libya is not clear, Donnie. So there's yeah. risk here. There's no question about it. There's risk militarily. There's risk financially. But we have upwards of 10 countries in the tinderbox of the world, the Middle East, in various stages of revolt. It, for the leader of the free world, the United States of America, it's not appropriate to be sitting on the sidelines and just watch history unfold without exerting some leadership. This president, I thought, was belated and timid in that regard. So, Governor, you say we can't sit on the sideline. Does that mean you would now intervene in other places, Yemen, Syria, Bahrain, places like that? Well, each one of these is different, Willie. So you can't just make a blanket statement about what we're going to do. They each have different backgrounds, cultures, histories, contexts. Take, for example, Syria. You got Bashir Assad, an Alawite, who's a sect of the Shia. He's got a Sunni population, a majority in his country. This is an individual who many in the United States mistakenly were duped into believing was a reformer, a change agent. He is a terrorist. He's a killer. He enabled people. So, would you have us going in there? No, but first of all, if I was the president of the United States, I wouldn't recognize and legitimize Syria and this administration, one of the most sinister in the world, by sending an ambassador to Syria, as President Obama did. I would start by recalling the ambassador. I would denounce Syria publicly, and I would speak to the Syrian people about how the United States stands with their hopes and dreams if to get rid of this, this individual. If you denounce the leader of Syria publicly, wouldn't that be like saying Gaddafi must go? Wouldn't you be getting yourself into the same situation? I mean, really, can you have it both ways? No, we're not saying... Qaddafi must go. For starters, recall the ambassador and said, tell the Syrian people who are seeking a, ch a change in leadership, or at least seeking reforms in their country, that we stand with their principles. That's a starting point. This president and his administration, including the Secretary of State, suggested that perhaps uh, he's a reformer, somebody that right. they can accommodate. Right. Yeah. So, you okay. think it's sides a reformer? Absolutely yeah, not. No, I think that's a complete crock, Bill. This is a, is he, he houses Hamas in his country. Uh, right. He uh, enables Hezbollah. He allowed people to transit through his country to kill American soldiers in Iraq. And I've been there five times uh, and three in Afghanistan. This person is not a reformer. He's a thug and he's a sinister dictator. But isn't, Governor, he, can I ask you a sure. question? But isn't he also limited in these other countries by what he has said, which is if the coalition doesn't allow it, if the Arab League doesn't allow it, then is it smart to subordinate our goals, our aims, our interest to that? Absolutely not. And of course, what you've been talking about this morning illustrates the point exactly have a leader of the free world, the president of the United States, who says Gaddafi must go, but he can't realize that goal through his own means or our own means because he's now entrapped by the subordination of American interests and power right. to the Arab League and the United Nations. And that's going to put him in, it has already put him in an untenable position. Governor, I want to bring it back home here. Let's go on the premise that elections are won with the economy. The Republican Party, is, uh, at least the field out there, is a party of no. Give me your playbook for the economy, Rob. Give me the platform right now. You're going to get the economy back on track. Not what the president is doing wrong, what you would do specifically to create jobs. Sure, Donnie. Well, first of all, we've got to have a strong dollar policy. A strong dollar reflects a strong economy and a strong country. I would stop the flooding of the economy of liquidity, fake liquidity. There is a limit to how far you can go with flooding the economy with fake money, fiat money, without having a consequence in terms of our standing around the world and our credit. That's number one. Number two, listen to the job providers and the investors and the deployers of capital as to what they need for this economy. And the 
answer, in short, is get the government burdens in the form of taxation, regulation, litigation, energy costs, workers' comp, unemployment insurance costs down, not up, and get government off my back, not more on my back. Three, we've got to have an educated and prepared workforce. We're not going to be a successful country if our people are uneducated and unskilled, unable to access the economy, ticked off and becoming wards of the state. That's not going to work morally, it's not going to work socially, and it's not going to work economically. It's also, by the way, the civil rights issue of our time. And the first thing this administration does when they come to Washington, D.C., or one of them, along with the Democratic Congress, is eliminate the scholarships for poor kids in one of the most decrepit school districts in the United States of America, Washington, D.C., and then they run around the country and talk about how they're for the disadvantage. Really? Then why are you shutting the door on poor kids having a better well, chance educationally in Washington, D.C.? Let's just ask about your party in Washington and the budget proposals being put forward or not. And where are the cuts? beyond the cuts to probably the areas of our country that need it the most. Where are the real cuts, the platform that your party stands for in terms of deficit reduction and trying to restore our fiscal health? Well, I know what, you would, like what would you have them do? I know you like uh, blunt and direct talk, Mika, yes. as do I, so do let me it. give it to you. First of all, this isn't, shouldn't be a debate between whether we're going to spend $3.65 trillion or $3.7 trillion. Right. That is not the range of difference between the Republicans and the Democrats appropriately defined. That's not the kind of bold action or rhetoric that people need or want, either in the campaign trail or in government. So you can't get out of this hole substantially without addressing entitlements. As I mentioned exactly. before on this show, we need to raise the retirement age for new entrants on Social Security. That's acceptable, I think, to most Americans for new entrants into the program. Number two, I'm not for means testing generally, but it's okay to means test at least the cost of living adjustment in Social Security, not the whole program. For Medicaid, we have to shut off the autopilot features, block grant it, and send the whole thing to the That's states. That's great. That's great. Is your party showing leadership on this front? Not yet. Okay. Not yet. What do they need to do and who needs to do it? Well, I would start by with this premise. Uh, politicians tend to get more courageous when their backs are up against the wall. So on this issue of never-ending continuing resolutions versus the prospect of a government shutdown, we don't wish that. I think that should be a last resort. But I think it is time to draw a line in the sand and have the showdown. Bill Bennett. Just quick on courage. There have been a few courageous governors, in my view, out there. Scott Walker, Chris Christie, John Kasich doing some interesting things. Some of the things that you, you did in Minnesota, their polls are, are collapsing, it looks like. Is that temporary? What's the message here? Well, Bill, I actually had the first government shutdown in Minnesota in 2005 first one in a 150-year history of my state. Was it ugly, difficult? Of course. Was it unpopular? Yes. A year later, I got reelected right. in one of the most difficult uh, states in the country for a conservative in one of the most difficult years politically in the modern so history. So persevere, do the right thing. Do is, the right thing. Is Governor Walker doing the right thing? Once again, obviously, nobody's denying we've got to balance the budgets, but to basically just go after the whole premise of what a union is and, and just, uh, to me, as far as just basically a ideological grab, do you agree with what he's doing? Donnie, I'm probably one of the few people in the race, maybe the only one in the race, who actually was in a union. I was in a union for seven years. My dad was a Teamster truck driver. I grew up in a meatpacking town. I come from a union family. Governor Walker is doing the right thing for this reason. You now have the unions, and specifically the public sector unions, not necessarily all the private sector uh, unions, the meatpacking plants, the coal miners, the folks who actually had industrial abuse back in the day. But now you have the public sector employees in this country having some of the best benefits, the best pay. They're some of the most coddled employees in the nation getting a better deal than the people who are paying the bill, namely the taxpayers. And the taxpayers have figured this out. They're ticked off and they want it changed. And it's the right but thing the unions to do. were willing to come to the table. He, he, this was about breaking the unions up. This was not about a fiscal responsibility. And, and to me, that... Well, okay. Willie. Governor, uh, we know you've got designs on the White House in 2012. Yeah. Um, a lot of names. You, like there are a lot of, lot of names in the hopper right now. Yeah. If you look at the polls, though, your name ID is, is near the bottom, despite your having been out there quite a bit over the last several months. How do you change the fact that the United States uh, doesn't really know who you are? <laughs> well, you have to get better known, but <clears throat> a couple of things. One is don't take these name ID early polls too seriously. History shows they're almost never a good predictor of the result. Number two, look at the early states, Iowa, New Hampshire, some other places where the results are already better and are getting better each week and each month. And three, as this unfolds, 
if you're a serious candidate for president of the United States, your name ID is going to be close to 100 percent by the end anyhow. But again, as Tamika's question earlier off air, uh, anybody who tries to predict or presume that they know what's going to happen in politics a year and a half or more before an election, it, it's quite presumptuous. So when your name ID is this low, you can't put these polls and say this is an extrapolation of what that. the future is going to be. I was be. laughed off the set when I brought up uh, candidate Barack Obama's name, and that changed. So I, 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 you're right. You're right. Uh, so then let me bring up a name and just you tell me what comes to mind as a potential rival, Donald Trump. I think he's talented. I think he's funny. I think he's interesting. Is he a candidate, a serious candidate? He might be. He might well, be, but, you know, we'll see. But uh, the, the country is going to have a choice between six, eight, ten candidates. What do you make of this angle with the birther controversy? I, you know, I... Up? I, for one, do not believe that we should be raising that issue in the sense that I think President Obama was born in the United States. CNN reported that they saw the birth certificate at one point. I saw a newscast where they reported that. So I question so his policies. That. No, I'm not. I'm not playing into that. You would think with Trump, if you were running for president, it would be about jobs and the economy. You wouldn't think he'd be doing the birther thing. And it was <laughs> for a while. He just got <laughs> on the birther kinda, thing about a week There's ago. a reason that he exists, and it's to talk about finances right. and the economy. Former Minnesota Governor Tim Pawlenty, thank you Thanks, very Governor. much. You're also, welcome. Bill Bennett, thank you thank for you. joining My us. Pleasure. Look forward to reading your book. Thank the you. book is The Fight of Our Lives. In a few minutes, Tom Brokaw will join us to break down the president.